Iwo Chioba currently serves as the Assistant City Manager and Director of Planning, Design, and Development with the City of Charlotte. Now, Taiwo has more than 26 years of experience nationally and internationally, including as Director of Planning for the Sacramento Regional Transit District and Director of Planning and Development for the Grand Rapids Transit Authority. Taiwo has managed multi-million dollar federally funded light rail, rapid uh, bus rapid transit, and streetcar projects across the U.S. And as director here in Charlotte, he's responsible for planning activities <clears throat> in Charlotte and unincorporated portions of Mecklenburg County, overseeing a department of, with five divisions. That's the Charlotte Urban Design Center, Long Range and Strategic Planning, Charlotte Regional Transportation Organization, Rezoning, Annexation, and Land Development. So he has a very, very full plate, which makes it even more amazing that he's here with us today. He currently oversees the city's rewrite of a 20-year comprehensive plan, the first since 1975, as well as the city's development code. His vision is for an equitable, livable, sustainable, and inclusive Charlotte. And we know that the work he and his team does is supremely creative work as well. So my fellow Charlotte creatives here to speak to us on our global theme of flow, please welcome the city's planning director and assistant city manager, Taiwo Jayoba. Come on up, Taiwo. Happy Friday, creative morning. All right, awesome. Good morning. So I'm going to share some of my personal stories with you and then kind of share that as a way to give you a backdrop to what has influenced my view of planning and why I believe we should do planning the way we ought to do them. All right. Well, that's where it all started. It's my parents married for almost 50 years before my dad passed. Uh, about five years ago, uh, but that's really where it all started, and uh, wonderful people. My dad was a college professor of nursing. My mom was a midwife, and both of them started um, a medical facility back in Nigeria. Mom still operates that. They've been doing that now for almost 40 years. But I grew up with these rascals. Now, you do not have permission to take this picture, all right, because if you do, then I know you might have to post them on Twitter, which means they will see it, and then they will kill me. And which also means that you won't have a planning director or an assistant city manager. But you'll notice on that screen also that there's only one of us smiling, and that's my sister who ended up becoming an attorney. And you know, lawyers have these strange smiles on their faces. Um, she probably knew she was going to do that. Um, now you can take this one. These are the guys who were the gang stars that I went to college with. And you can take that picture so we can expose them for who they really are. <laughs> they really made my life miserable in college. I graduated when I was about 20 years old. I was barely 20 uh, when I graduated from college. But I, I tell you that a lot of what I did then uh, was really formed by a lot of guys who surrounded me here because they were also my neighbors. Now, share with you my dad here. He's a great guy. Um, this guy really, more than I would say anyone, uh, influenced my decision to be a planner. It really wasn't my decision. So I graduated with a degree in geography, and I wanted to be a pilot or join the military, something that would give me power or money, something like that. But then I remember one day I came home, and he said to me, I already paid to college. You're going to be a planner. You're going to go and study to be for your master's degree in planning. We had a big argument over that because I didn't want to be a planner. I felt that going to do master's, my worst fear was that I was going to end up like my dad, a university professor who had no money. And so I didn't want to be that. And so when he said, you're going to study for master's in planning, all of a sudden, I'm just, I could just see myself in classroom teaching. And so I didn't want to do that. But then he said, you're going to change the world. And so this guy had a plan for my future. How many of you watched The Godfather? Remember that place where they were having a plan for Michael's future? And Michael said, you're planning for my future? Or I kind of felt like Michael. The only difference was that I didn't have a godfather. I didn't have any mob. <laughs> and I didn't have any money. So kicking and screaming, I went to college to, for two years. Um, to study planning. So let's give it up for Pops. I mean, he's a great guy. I mean, so I wouldn't be here today if he didn't make me do that. All right. So, but then um, 1996, um, I moved to Sacramento, California, 
and um, she lived in that shared accommodation. The picture you see on your top left hand corner is actually the Habitat for Humanity shared accommodation that I stayed in when I first moved to Sacramento in 1996. Now, you see from that point to the bus stop on Ward Avenue um, was just a short walk. And so for the first time, for the first several weeks after we arrived, obviously we had no vehicle and we knew nobody in the entire city. And so being able to be in close proximity to that bus line was a lifesaver. Uh, and so, you know, I always say that transit could either be a lifeline or a lifestyle. For some people, it's a lifeline. That's really all they depend upon. For some of us, it's a lifestyle. We can choose to leave our vehicles at home and jump on the bus or train to go somewhere. In this instance, we didn't have a vehicle. So that was a lifeline. And then several weeks of several months after that, I got a job as a planner uh, with the city of Sacramento. And then eventually we were able to cobble up some money and bought this small townhouse uh, closer to that bus line again. And from that bus line to the light trail station down the street was only about a 15 minutes ride. And then from that transit station to my office where I worked uh, in downtown Sacramento, I was roughly about 20 some minutes. And so being in, because I had an opportunity in downtown Sacramento, there was no Uber then, there was no Lyft then. And because I was a poor planner, I couldn't spend my money every day riding a cab to work. So this transit really gave me accessibility to opportunity that would not have been possible if I wasn't in close proximity to that. So that has kind of influenced the way that I look at world, the world. When I think about this word equity, I always feel that sometimes we tend to use it and, and we use it loosely. Um, but in my mind, I always think of six words that should define and shape a city. And obviously one of them is equity. But if we're not careful, Equity will just be a buzzword, right? And so it's very important that a city that's becoming equitable should also be affordable to people. And so lived in this shared accommodation in Sacramento, the stipend that Habitat was really given as a result of working, doing sweat equity, the property was uh, about $500 a month. How many of you know that $500 a month doesn't go anywhere? Not in Charlotte, definitely not in California. But being able to afford a shared accommodation really gave me opportunity to be able to live in that place. But it was also very important that proximity to a means of mobility was very, very essential in order for us to be able to uh, take advantage of the opportunity that I had. All of these words, accessibility, opportunity, mobility, proximity, affordability, equity, really should be the six words that should shape and define any city that wants to be a place <laughs> where people feel they belong or where people feel that they leave a mark. I would not have thought in 1996 that I would be standing in front of you today, but for the opportunity that I was given. But not only was I given that opportunity, I was able to access that opportunity simply because there were other means of mobility around me that allowed me to be able to make um, that opportunity a real thing. And so when we talk about Charlotte Future 2040, this in my mind is the outcome of Charlotte Future 2040, creating complete communities where people can have accessibility to clean hair, where people can have accessibility to means of mobility. Not everybody will be able to drive. We have over 250,000 people in Charlotte today who do not drive or have access to vehicles. And so how do we make sure that we make this an equitable city for them? We have a lot of people who work in industries that do not just make enough income. How do we make sure that they live in proximity to means of mobility that will really get them to where they need to go? You see, opportunity is just opportunity if people can access it. If you live on one side of town and then you get a job on another side of town, how do you even get there? And if your transit system is one where you have to wait in between two lines for about 15 minutes, and if you miss that connection, your commute time becomes two hours, you might lose that job. Or if you have to get to your doctor, but there's no other means of getting there other than a neighbor picking you up, or someone driving you there, or you, you have accessibility to public transit, it's definitely impossible to create equitable cities if we don't have 
opportunity that's, you know, where you can actually access things that should really be basic in life. So we talk about creating a future Charlotte where we have communities that provide residents with safe, convenient access to a variety of housing, jobs, goods, because all of these things really flow together. We can't talk about one without talking about the other. So I like to think about in the next um, several months, uh, several weeks, as we engage the community, as we develop our plan, that we're going to be talking about how does this become the end result of that Charlotte future 2040. So for the next several weeks, you probably saw this. Uh, this slide was not meant for you to read, necessarily. So <laughs> I'm just trying to make a point here. Yeah. Um, so you probably saw a poster of this if you have attended any of our recent meetings this week or maybe one of it is outside. We have a booth outside or a table outside there. But over the next several weeks, what we've been doing is to engage people to help us develop what a preferred growth scenario for Charlotte should be. In the next 20 years, we're expecting over 300,000 people. Our projections are telling us that we'll add about 325,000 more people to our population. In the next 10 years, right now today, Charlotte has about 9,000 visually impaired people. So in the next 10 years, that number will double to about 18,000. In the next 20 years, that number will probably double again to about 40,000. And so, as we talk about how do we grow and how do we accommodate the number of people who come into our city, we come up with different scenarios. If you were to go to the scenario that's on my farthest left side, that's where we are today, that's business as usual. But these other scenarios are really, how do we want to accommodate that growth? Should they continue to live in the neighborhoods today? Should they continue to live around transit stations and give them the type of lifeline that I had when I first moved to the United States from Nigeria? And so it's very important that as we think about our future, it's looking at opportunities for us to be able to see how do we truly really want to grow. None of this scenario is better than the other, but there are things in each one of those scenarios that are advantageous over the other. So it's really about picking one. It's like a menu, right? You go to a restaurant and you pick some. So it's really about picking the ones that work best for us in order for us to end up being able to develop the type of scenario uh, that will be helpful for Charlotte. In my mind, this is really what equity means. It really means being fair, meeting people at different stages of their lives, not providing the same thing for everybody, but meeting people at different stages of their life, whether they're eight years old or 18 years old or 82. It's about aging in place. It's about making sure that if when I stop living in that 3,000 square foot home, I can easily move next door to a 1,000 square foot home and do not have to leave my community. I do not have to leave my doctor. I do not, my children don't have to sacrifice and leave their teachers simply because I have to move away. But we have to ask ourselves a lot of questions. How comfortable I am if I have condominiums, townhouses, duplexes, multi, the triplexes right next to my 3,000 single family home, we have to get comfortable with these things as a city that's growing. We are getting a whole lot of veterans who are moving into Charlotte. Over 150,000 veterans live in our county. And we continue to be top five city in the country for millennials. And at the end of the day, it's about mixing the type of housing unit, mixing the type of jobs, mixed income, mixed, mixed use development around things that can really make people closer to where they need to do life on a daily basis. So equity for me means that I may be 50 years old today, but one day I'm going to be 80 years old. So I need the sidewalks that will get me to where I need to go when I no longer am able when I'm no longer able to walk and I'm on wheelchair. It's about thinking about that future today that will make it possible for us so that Charlotte is not just for one person or one group of people, but a city for all of us where we feel we belong and where we truly can make our mark. My wife is here this morning. She probably hates that I said that because she's really very quiet, but she's going to forgive me, all right, because you all are here. And... and and I know I'm not going to sleep on the couch tonight either. Um, but, you know, our family came from England 
a few weeks ago to spend summer vacation with us, and we were uh, walking uptown, and then we got to the corner of the intersection of Trade and Tryon, and Cora, my sister-in-law, said, what are these, the meanings of these inscriptions on these four statues? How many of you know that those four statues actually have inscriptions on them? Okay, great, that's wonderful. One is transportation, one is industry, one is future, right, and one is commerce. I always believe that the sign that our city has arrived and could be defined as an equitable city is that one day we change one of those inscriptions to equitable city because equity is good business. Equity is the story of our future. And so in my mind, I truly believe that that will be the story that we've arrived when we can look at that and say, hey, listen, we need to alter one of these inscriptions and change it to equitable city. So again, creative morning, thank you very much for having me this morning. I believe that our future is bright, our future is great. I definitely would love to be back again in the future. I'd like to self-invite, just so you know. Taiwo Jaiobe, everybody. Thank you, Taiwo. We love you. We love you, Charlotte. We'll see you next month.